Thank you, Ray. Thanks, everybody. So, wow. It's nice to see everyone so cozy, and this must be really exciting. So, um, my, my talk is pretty dry, I'll be honest. I mean, it's, I have to go through sort of why are you here today, because maybe after I finish my talk, if I do a good job, half of you might leave because you're not supposed to be in the drug track. But um, hopefully you, that's not going to be the case, and you'll stay anyway because all the talks are so good. So uh, as Ray mentioned, uh, I'm with the Office of New Drugs. The Office of New Drugs in the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research is the office that's responsible for managing and monitoring all the new drug products. Um, and what that entails is we oversee the clinical investigations and then the marketing registration for new drug products. So what I hope to cover today is introduce you to the IND process and the clinical trial regulations behind them, discuss how to determine if an IND is needed, and then summarize the types of INDs and the categories of INDs to help you understand how we sort of manage the, the work related to INDs. And then share some information with you on the pre-IND consultation program, which I think is the most important part of my talk, which is expanded upon in the following talk on best practices for communication by Rachel after, uh, I think, right around 1130. So a quick poll before we dive in. Who in the audience, and I guess um, online if we have that uh, capability, works in the development of new drugs? Good. All right. So you should stay, most of you. Who in the audience works on the development of new biologics? Great. You should also stay. Who in the audience has conducted a clinical investigation? Oh, we've got some polls coming in here. That's okay. You can show those. Yeah, good. So who in the audience has conducted a clinical investigation or human research study? Okay. So, so we've got some, some real experts here. Let's see how we've got... Right, those on the phone or on the Adobe should also continue to watch. Good. What about those who have submitted an IED application? So you're really the experts. Do you know why you submitted the IED application? You just did it because you were told? <laughs> okay, good. Some of you, I think it's the same number that raised their hand and said they submitted an IED, said they knew why. So that's good. If you didn't know why you submitted it or you're not sure if you need to submit one, this talk will be for you, okay? So you can bring that down back to the slides. Thank you, Jeff. All right. So what is an IND? I think I kept saying IND before I actually spelled it out. So that's, apologies. That's, we all have our lingo. At the FDA, we have our lingo. At your companies, you have your lingo. So we use a lot of acronyms. Sometimes we can use complete sentences, nothing but acronyms. So forgive us for that. But So IND stands for Investigational New Drug Application. The term was actually coined sort of synonymously with the new drug application, which and I'll talk about what came about or why, what the impetus was for the new drug application as well as I get into the legal and regulatory history. Essentially what the IND is, is it's an exemption from the Food and Drug Cosmetic Act that has requirements for any new drug application. Uh, it's a means to obtain FDA permission to ship your unapproved uh, product basically across a state line, so into interstate commerce, which obviously most likely you need to do if you're going to be conducting a clinical study because you're usually not just at one site. The primary location for the regulatory requirements that actually implement this exemption are found in 21 CFR 312. So I, I, I'm the first to go, so I get the opportunity to explain a little bit about Code of Federal Regulations. So for those of you who still know what paper is and what you know, printouts look like, that's these books here on the shelves. These are the Code of Federal Regulations. I get all my CFR electronically now. It's just much easier. You can search through it. But we also still have the paper copies, and that's what they look like. So CFR obviously stands for Code of Federal Regulations. It's organized into titles, and the titles are basically around the different areas that we regulate. For example, Homeland Security, um, Food, Drug, and Cosmetics are in 21, uh, et cetera. And then within each of those titles, we have different sections for the different types of requirements. So for example, for the investigational new drug application, all of those regulatory requirements are in 312. For the actual new drug application, so the NDA, those are in section 314. So apologies for the typo there. Legal, that's the, the French term, if I'm correct, Jeff. Uh, but legal and regulatory history, it's really important to understand this history to then understand the origins of the IND application itself. So we'll go all the way back to first 1902 for the Biologics Control Act. This act was passed by Congress after about three months of discussion, uh, very minimal debate within Congress, which is pretty unheard of. I mean, even 118 years ago, that was pretty unheard of. And it was really the result of a, a big tetanus outbreak in St. Louis. 
couple of other smaller occurrences related to smallpox vaccines and diphtheria. Um, but for the most part, uh, it's the St. Louis tetanus outbreak for that vaccine. And the Biologics Control Act set in place some requirements for the regulation of the commercial production of vaccines, serums, toxins, or antitoxins to make sure that they were safe, pure, and potent. A couple years later, conversely, the 1906 Food and Drugs Act was passed by Congress after 25 years of debate. And really the impetus to finally pass that uh, piece of legislation was Upton Sinclair's novel called The Jungle, which really detailed in grotesque you know, level of detail the unsanitary practices in the meatpacking industry. And as a result of that, Congress was finally sort of moved by public opinion to pass this piece of legislation that required that drugs, foods, and liquids or drinks not be misbranded or adulterated. Misbranded means they, they do what they say they do on the labeling or they include what they say they're supposed to include in that product. <clears throat> but it wasn't until 20 years later that the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act was passed in 1938 that actually required a pre-approval of the product before it came onto the market. And that pre-approval was really only related to the safety. And the reason it is for this piece of legislation was the sulfonilamide elixir disaster, where more than 100 people died because of the preparations of the elixir sulfonilamide, which is a relatively innocuous product. But the solubilizer that was used was, I believe, was polyethylene glycol, which for those chemists in the room is, anyone know? Antifreeze, right? So that's probably not very safe. And so a lot of people died, including some children. Um, and really, the reason there was a big you know, problem in the, the impetus to pass this law wasn't that they used polyethylene glycol. It was that they didn't use alcohol as the solubilizer because that was really the only requirement we had that elixirs at the time had to have alcohol as the solubilizer and not any other type of a, of a product so, or ingredient. So that wasn't enough to ensure that products were safe, and so Congress had to pass the Food and Drug and Cosmetic Act. And so at this po point in time, we now had a new system for regulating drugs in the United States where some authority, the FDA, was going to have to then say that this product could be safely marketed. And when the Food and Drug and Cosmetic Act was passed, it also applied these requirements to biologics, which were set forth also in the Biologics Control Act. So at the time, the definition, which I'll talk about in a minute, included drugs and biologics. But we still don't really have efficacy. We don't really have to tell anybody that we're going to study our products yet. That came another 20 years later or so in 1962 with the Kefauer-Harris Amendments Act. And so for those history buffs in the room, we all know the story of Dr. Francis Kelsey. So this was, again, if you're not catching the theme here, really bad things happen. Congress, the United States, the FDA, they move, they pass new legislation, new protections. Um, there was no different with uh, the Kefauer-Harris Drug Amendments Act, which resulted as a, uh, because of the thalidomide disaster. So thalidomide was a product that was approved in other parts of the world uh, as a sedative, and it was being used quite extensively for morning sickness. And then there started to be significant numbers of reports, and this actually came out around the same time or slightly after the United States was reviewing it, and, and Dr. Kelsey was reviewing it, but there were turning out to be lots of reports of uh, pregnant women uh, or mothers delivering babies with severe birth defects. It wasn't clear that there was a causal relationship at that time, but when Dr. Kelsey was reviewing the marketing application on the grounds of safety at the time, she didn't see the animal reproductive toxicity studies that we typically would have expected to see for such a product being used in pregnant women. And she held the line and she said, no, we're not going to approve this product until we get these studies. And she held the line for so long that there were so many more, unfortunately, so many more cases of the birth defects being seen that a causal relationship was established and it was seen as this great big significant milestone that, okay, FDA held the line, we didn't approve this product that was unsafe, but you know what, we need to make sure we do this for all the products. And so the safety requirements were strengthened at that time for drugs in the Kefauer-Harris Amendments Act. Another also very important piece was the requirements for efficacy. So not only did the product have to prove that it was safe, but it had to prove that it was efficacious, that it worked. And so, now, I should have mentioned that in 1912 there were the Shirley Amendments to the Food and Drug Act, and that did say that you couldn't have false therapeutic claims, but the legal standard was you could drive a truck through it, and it was really hard to kind of prove it. So it really wasn't until these Kefauer-Harris Amendments Act that you actually had to prove substantial or provide substantial evidence of effectiveness. What that meant is that now companies or sponsors or researchers are going to have to study their products and prove or provide evidence to the FDA before the product could be on the market that it worked, that it was effective. 
which meant more clinical investigations, more studies. Well, these products aren't all that safe. Their safety is uh, unestablished, so they're going to need to have some other controls in place to make sure that subjects are not going to be exposed to risk or undue harm while they're studying these products. In 1963, we codified or laid out our requirements in the regulations for how we would implement the Kefauer Harris Amendments Act, and that's where the IND was born. And again, the term at the time, so the Kefauer Harris Drug Amendments Act, we had new drug applications as a result of the Food and Drugs Act, and so the, the IND application, the term was synonymously coined to sort of line up against the NDA terminology. So what's the purpose of the IND? So as mentioned earlier, it's sort of to notify the regulators of their intent to conduct the studies because we want to make sure that there's reasonable uh, expectation of safety or protections for human subjects. It's also to provide some preclinical data indicating that the drug is reasonably safe and provide information on the manufacturing and processes and the chemistry background. So we can identify really novel and interesting drugs all the time, but can we reproducibly manufacture them in ways that are safe and that we can be assured that the, the drug potency, the dose level, the concentration is always going to be the same. Otherwise, not only is that a safety concern, but you may not be able to interpret the clinical efficacy findings because your drug could be more concentrated in one batch versus the next. So we also have to look at a lot of that chemistry and manufacturing information. And of course, it describes the initial study that's going to be proposed. Not only was this to ensure that uh, the safety of subjects was going to be protected, but also that the study would actually provide some important information that would help us further understand or characterize the product. And finally, it provides assurance that an institutional review board, which is sort of like an ethics committee, would approve the study and approve the study protocol before it begins. In addition to the IND submission itself, so those, there's lots of little pieces, and I encourage you to look into 21 CFR 312, and I think there's actually a talk from uh, Maureen Dillon Parker later in the session that goes into the specific requirements of the submission. There's like 10 parts and subparts, and I'm sure it's, it's very complicated and daunting initially, but Maureen will make it all feel very simple. Um, but in addition to that submission itself, the investigator actually has to sort of sign a commitment that they'll be, uh, and that commitment will be maintained on a form by the sponsor that indicates that they're qualified to conduct the study. So they're not a nurse practitioner, for, for example, conducting a very rigorous clinical investigation, or they're not a pharmacist. Um, they actually have to be an MD or a medical practitioner. Um, they have to indicate where the location of the research will be, uh, the various different sites. Uh, they have to also name who the IRB is that's going to be reviewing the study protocol because remember one of the requirements was that an IRB is reviewing this. So we want to make sure that we have um, a qualified or a well-established uh, institutional review board. They also have to um, sort of commit that they will personally conduct or supervise the conduct of the investigation themselves. Now studies, they, they get very complex. There's lots of actual sub-investigators involved, but still they have to commit that they're going to oversee the overall study. And even if they delegate certain responsibilities, that they're still supervising that. They also have to inform potential subjects uh, at any time, the beginning and constantly throughout the actual investigations, that the drugs are being used for an investigational purpose. And they also have to report on any adverse events that occur during the study. So now we need to ask ourselves the question, when is an IND needed? And to answer that question, you have to ask yourself three questions. So the first one is, is it a drug? You think it's simple, but give me a second. It's not quite that simple. Then is it being used in a clinical investigation? I actually think this one is a little bit more clear. And then finally, does it meet the exemption criteria? And I think that's also pretty clear because we've been pretty descriptive in our regulatory requirements or in our regulations, although you have to get used to reading regulations to understand them. I apologize. I didn't write them. Um, so is it a drug? So the definition for a drug, you have to go to the Food and Drug and Cosmetic Act. And this is where we define a drug as any article intended uh, for use, and that's a very important uh, aspect, intended for use, in the diagnosis, treatment, prevention, uh, or mitigation of a disease. And in the article also, other than a food, to intend it to uh, affect the structure or function of the body. That may sound confusing, so the simplest might be um, hair loss. That's a structure, function, hair growth of the body. Uh, not necessarily something you would typically consider to be a disease, but alopecia uh, fits into that category. I mentioned intended use is very important. So just because you think something is a drug, you know, it's a tablet form or something like that, doesn't mean it's a drug. The definition really is in that intended use and not necessarily the nature of the substance. Um, also note that 
The second part of this definition, the structure function, doesn't apply to dietary supplements. Um, I think the, my favorite example is uh, cranberry juice or cranberry extract. And I've actually seen it from, from multiple indications, but the, the easiest uh, example to help you understand is, is for urinary tract infections. So if I wanted to conduct a study with cranberry extract, let's say in a pill form or even in a liquid form, even just juice, um, and my hypothesis for doing that study was to improve urinary tract health or just urinary tract function in general. That would be, that's not a drug claim. That would be sort of more along the lines of a dietary supplement claim. However, if I was being more specific and I said I actually want to prevent urinary tract infections or decrease the, the length of a urinary tract infection, that would actually be a drug claim because now I'm preventing or I'm treating a disease. Does that kind of help explain the example? Um, and I'll note out that foods don't really fit, even if a food was affecting structure function, um, it doesn't quite fit into the drug category. And this one's really complicated, and if we have time at the end, we'll do a questions on it. But if you look at, and this is a very interesting thing, if you look at the guidance on exemptions from INDs, there's a section that's actually called, it's grayed out, and it says it's stayed related to some additional sort of negotiations uh, related to the food requirements. So it's, it's kind of a really nuanced, complicated one that I probably couldn't explain even in another 30-minute talk. But for this time at the end, we could talk about those questions. Uh, what about biologicals? Because I know a few of you raised your hands and said you work on biologicals. So a biological is also considered a drug. As I mentioned, the, when the Food and Drug and Cosmetic Act was passed, it included those biological products defined here on the slide. Um, some interesting justifications going on there in the, in the margins. But basically, viruses, therapeutic serums, therapeutic proteins, synthetically or human-derived uh, products are considered to be biologicals and drugs. Now, there's some differences. So I'm from the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research, CEDAR, and there's also the Center for Biological Evaluation and Research, CBER. And so the therapeutic biologics, I think more along the lines of a synthetically derived uh, protein, for example, and, and there's, there's broader categories, not just the synthetically derived. Those would go to CEDAR, whereas the human derived, so a vaccine um, or a blood product would go to CBER. And there's a lot more nuance in that, but those are sort of some more clear distinctions between the two. Um, so is it being used in a clinical investigation? So I, I mentioned this one's kind of simple. So anytime you're doing a study involving human research subjects, that's most likely going to be a clinical investigation. And also you're experimenting. So you're, you're trying to understand something about the product uh, in that research study. Whether it's safe, whether it works, that's considered a clinical investigation. Uh, it's typically conducted by a pharmaceutical company that's trying to get a product onto the market, but it can also be conducted by an, an academic uh, or an academic institution trying to maybe understand how a product is used to support some, you know, increased knowledge uh, in journal publications and citations and things of that nature. So does it meet IND exemption criteria? So 21 CFR 312.2 also gives some pretty clear uh, uh, descriptions of criteria where you could be exempt from the IND regulations. So if the product is already approved, and for the context uh, in the United States, that means it's the subject of an approved NDA or new drug application or a biologics licensing application, a BLA, or it's the subject of an over-the-counter or OTC monograph. So if it's approved, most likely it's exempted if it's being used for an approved indication. So I used to not say this, but I think it's important to say this. So just because a product is improved or is approved doesn't mean it's approved for all uses or approved for all doses. So you guys are probably really keen on this, you know. That's why you have to go through all this FDA, IND stuff because, you know, you want to get a new indication approved or something. But I'll also mention that just because a product is approved doesn't mean other doses or other indications are even safe. We really don't know that until it's been studied for those indications or for those doses. And so for that reason, that's why it's usually not exempted for an unapproved use, even though the product is approved. So some additional IND exemption criteria, and you have to meet all of these. So we, we just talked about it's not for a new, new indication. It also wouldn't result in significant labeling changes. So if you would be able to say, my product can be taken with food um, as a result of the study, and it was currently being, or actually you wouldn't do that. You would go the other way. You'd probably want uh, to go to without food if it was currently food. But let's say you wanted to change from take the product with food to without food. That would be a significant labeling change and would not be exempt from the IND regulations for that study. I wouldn't support a significant change in advertising. So the context of use of how the product would be used. 
that type of study would not be exempt from the IND requirements. It does not involve a route of administration or dosing level or patient population that significantly increases the risk. So every um, decision to approve a product on the market, it's, a, it's kind of a clinical judgment call. Like there's no specific requirement for efficacy or safety for any given product, for any given indication. Each sort of review application is sort of a, a unique situation. And they evaluate the risk and the benefit of that proposed use uh, in the context of the information that they have. And so when a product is approved, it gets very descriptive labeling. You've seen the fine print legalese type you know, documents that are 15 pages long that outline how the product should be used for a very specific indication. This is the types of things you might see. So when you start to evaluate a new route of administration or a new dose, you start to alter that risk benefit interpretation of that original approval. And that requires a study to more further understand that. And that's why you, have, you wouldn't be exempt from the IND requirements. Um, a really good example, or a very obvious example, for at least for parents, is just because a product is approved and it seems to be safe in adults, doesn't mean that it's safe in children. Doses are usually far too high, or it's not even efficacious in children. So it's really important to understand when you move into new patient populations, particularly children, you're most likely altering that risk-benefit uh, determination, and you're going to have to do additional studies under an IND to understand that. Uh, you still have to comply with the human subject protection requirements in 21 CFR um, 56 for IRBs or institutional review boards and part 50 for the informed consent. And then you still have to, to comply with the promotion and charging requirements that are in 312.7. So along the lines of you can't sell the product under an IND, you can only do that if you have a approved NDA or BLA application. And I oversimplify things and so if, if you really know a lot of the stuff and you know, oh that's not quite true, Talk to me afterwards, but I'm trying to oversimplify some of these things. Um, there's also some very specific criteria, and I won't read them for being exempt from the IND requirements. And they're kind of carve outs for some things that were grandfathered in over the years uh, in doing research. So, for example, in vitro biological diagnostics, uh, blood grouping serums, reagent blood cells, some radioactive drugs for certain types of research use or imaging studies. I encourage you to go to the CFR to understand those. Uh, in more detail, if you think you might fit in one of those categories. So now you know that when, a, when an IND is needed. You know it's a drug, you know it's a clinical investigation, and you know you're not exempt. So you need an ID, but well, what's next? We'll talk about that in just a second. But before that, I want to sort of dig into categories of INDs and types of INDs. And these aren't in the regulations or even in the legislation, but they're in place by the centers to help us sort of organize and manage our work. Because we receive more than 1,500 INDs per year and more than 1,000 expanded access INDs, which I'll explain what those are in a minute per year. And we have to have a way to sort of organize ourselves to review all these applications. So the two broad categories are commercial INDs and non-commercial INDs. And the reasons we sort of distinct, uh, have distinctions for the two, uh, a good example is you know, we just have different policy requirements. So for example, two weeks ago, uh, we changed the commercial requirements, and this was announced you know, years ago, but we changed the commercial requirements for electronic submission of the IND application. So if you're a commercial entity, you have to submit your application electronically using the electronic common technical document um, requirements. So the common technical document is an international conference of harmonization standard for how you organize those different parts of the application. Now, for if you're a non-commercial entity, so you're an academic uh, institution or an individual sponsor investigation doing a study, you don't have to comply with those requirements. So that's an instance where we have a difference in policy, and that's the reason why we have these different types of categories of, of IND applications. Now there's different uh, broad types. So there are IND applications for conducting clinical investigations, and there are IND application types for conducting expanded access. So a clinical investigation is basically what we've been talking about so far this morning. So you're doing an investigation to understand how a product works, to further understand its safety, characterize that safety, perhaps understand the efficacy as well. Expanded access or treatment is, is as it sounds, you're actually treating a patient. You're not trying to understand or do a research study of the prevention, treatment, or diagnosis. You're actually trying to prevent, treat, or diagnose a disease. There's some pretty specific categories for expanded access. So it has to be a, a very severe, uh, life-threatening condition. You have to have uh, exhausted all uh, alternative options and therapies, or there simply couldn't be any. Um, and you have to have already try to enroll in any clinical trials if there are any for that, for that disease and for that product. Um, again, it really applies to treatment versus uh, an investigation. There's three 
types of expanded access IEDs, and I forget, I was trying to look, but then I, I got rushed. Uh, we used to have a more detailed talk about expanded access IEDs, but I'm not sure if we have one of those in this session. Um, but there's three you know, general uh, types of expanded access IEDs. So there's the individual, which could be non-emergency or emergency. Um, think very life-threatening. Uh, there's an investigational product that I know of. <clears throat> I want to use it for my patient. Um, and so you might, if you know how to, you'll pick up the phone and you'll call the sponsor, find out if you can get the drug, and then you'll be advised to call the FDA and get approval for that or authorization for that emergency IND use for that individual patient. Uh, intermediate size patient population, this is any more than just one patient. Uh, so you might be studying a couple of dozen. And then treatment expanded access IND, where you might be studying you know, up to a few hundred patients. Typically, the treatment I expanded access INDs are conducted by a more commercial entity who might have pretty well understood safety and efficacy on the product, but maybe they're just waiting for marketing approval and there's a lot of patients that were in the clinical trials that need to continue to stay on their product or stay on the drug. And so for that reason, they'll roll into a treatment IND. Very different than if you have an individual expanded access IND where it might just be one patient, maybe one physician who wants to try and treat a patient who's exhausted all their options. I don't get into a lot more detail on expanded access, but if you want to, feel free to grab me after or maybe in the networking session. So what happens when you submit the IND application to the FDA? So we figure out it's commercial, it's academic, we apply the right kinds of policies, and then we need to send it to a division where it can be reviewed. Uh, and they'll bring in various different discipline constituents, so clinicians, obviously. There might be clinical pharmacologists if they're evaluating the dose. There's going to be chemists or quality reviewers involved toxicologists and pharmacologists looking at the preclinical or non-clinical animal studies. Um, and in order to sort of help us manage all of that work, it doesn't just go into one giant pot. We have multiple review divisions. And they actually organize themselves by uh, therapeutic areas. And that helps us intake the applications and direct them to where perhaps the primary endpoint would be in that therapeutic area for it to be managed. Um, the reason this is important is because Clinicians, they specialize, and so a, a gastroenterologist might be better situated to understand the endpoints for irritable bowel or, or certain bowel movement disorders versus the endpoints related to a neurological disorder. Uh, and the same would be true maybe for a chemist. So if, if the product was coming in and it was in a different route of administration, for example, on orally disintegrating tablet, the chemistry requirements are very different than if this was a liquid suspension. And so we might have to sort of direct these different types of products and different applications to different parts of the center. Um, our portfolios are defined by the primary endpoint, as I mentioned, um, and precedent's a big factor in that. Um, if the jurisdiction is not clear through the endpoints, then we'll look at the safety, and the safety can be a good uh, determining factor into where those applications will go. A good example is if the product is, let's say it's uh, to treat um, diarrhea associated with carcinoid tumors, but there's a sa clear safety signal of tumor promotion as well. That'll probably need to go to the oncology division because the tumor promotion sort of outweighs uh, the endpoints for the, the diarrhea. Um, I think another good example, maybe to help illustrate this, might be uh, septic shock. So if you were treating the bugs that cause the septic shock, the, the anti-infective treatments, that would go to our antimicrobial review divisions. But if you were just treating the sort of downstream circulatory responses in the septic shock, that might go to the, the allergy or the pulmonology uh, uh, review divisions. Um, Chemotherapy-induced alopecia is another good example. Sorry, I'm picking on baldness. But, um, so the, the chemotherapy itself would go to the oncology division, but then the alopecia indication would go to the dermatology review division. It's simply by nature of the, the, the types of endpoints and the types of study designs that need to be evaluated by the right kinds of experts. Um, so, it's, it's can be really kind of daunting to understand all of this. And plus, I don't even know who all the review divisions are in, in, in FDA or in the Office of New Drugs. So how am I supposed to figure this out? So there's, I used to have a, like the next 12 slides would have detailed each division and each phone number. But there's just too many. It's kind of overwhelming. So I encourage you to follow the link in the slide here. And that'll take you to the Office of New Drugs website. And you can click through each of the uh, individual offices about a drug evaluation each of the individual clinical review divisions and it actually has a short blurb or description about the types of products that are evaluated within each of those review divisions. So you should be able to figure out, you should, should know very well like what your drug is doing, the type of study you're conducting, and then based on review, reviewing those blurbs on this website you can probably figure out which division it should go to 
But if you're only like 80% sure, that's okay. Go ahead and direct the application to that review division. And then the review divisions will sort of discuss amongst themselves and work out the jurisdiction issues if they need to. Um, yeah, that's all I was going to say about that. Um, so the last kind of thing I'll, I'll talk about regarding the, the actual process of submitting these applications is what if I have multiple indications? What if I'm not sure what my indication would be? Can I include all of this in one IND application? Or will I have to submit multiple IND applications? So this is something else that's not in the, the regulatory requirements or in the legislation. It's more along the lines of, of, of policy within the center. Um, but essentially, okay, um, you can bundle your applications if you're really early in development and you don't quite know exactly what indications you're going to be studying. So you, and they're, they're also relatively similar indications. It's not like you're studying one neurology indication and one GI indication. It's more like you're studying two uh, more specific neurology indications, for example. Um, it's also helpful if those indications would be reviewed in the same review division. It's not necessarily required, but it certainly helps. And again, mentioned how I, I mentioned uh, earlier that applications might need to be directed to different experts. So if an application has to be split across multiple divisions, that can get really inefficient and ineffective. And you, wouldn't, you probably wouldn't want that on your end for that application being reviewed by you know, two or three different medical officers. You would probably want to have one medical officer or at least one similar medical team to review it. Um, closely related routes of administration. So I, I mentioned the, the chemists, you know, depending on the formulation, there are different uh, quality requirements. And we have different experts who are, you know, more proficient in certain requirements that would review those applications. So we would try to keep those together. And then any combination of two or more investigational drugs uh, being used for a concomitant use, you could bundle those together. And there's more nuances around bundling when it gets to the time of actually submitting the marketing application. And there's, um, for you guys, it's not so much relevant because if you're a small business administration, you can usually get a waiver of your first time user fee application for an NDA. But it does become relevant as you hopefully do your second, third, and fourth, and so on marketing application. The first application you submit, you can bundle indications and you can bundle uh, routes of administration together and pay only one user fee. Versus if you submit one indication and then follow up with a supplement, which is sort of like an amendment to the application, you may have to pay another user fee. So bundling be also becomes relevant for the marketing applications. Um, so when shouldn't you bundle? Um, so if you're developing the product for two or more unrelated conditions, as I mentioned, um, uh, you have multiple dosage forms that would probably require that application to be reviewed across multiple chemistry teams. Um, and then multiple routes of administration. Uh, those, these would be situations where you probably wouldn't be advised to bundle the application. Or you, if you tried to, the review divisions might advise you to sort of break them apart and submit separate applications. So next steps. Um, you know you need an IND. You know um, where you sort of need to submit it. You figured out the jurisdiction question. Uh, you know it's just one application, so you're going to bundle it together. What's next? So this follows or transitions right into the next talk really well, the pre-ID consultation program. Um, so we highly encourage you to take advantage of the FDA's pre-ID consultation program or meeting uh, programs with you. So at no cost, uh, if you're an IND sponsor or you're thinking about considering an IND, so you're sort of pre-IND stages, um, developing a drug product, you can submit a request to us for pre-IND advice or to have a pre-IND meeting. Um, you can ask for us, ask us questions about the types of data that would be needed to prove that the studies you're going to conduct are safe. Uh, you can ask us what sort of pharmacology and toxicology studies are going to be needed. Uh, you can even ask us about the general requirements for the content for your ID application because you couldn't quite figure out um, what the regs were saying. Or you might even ask us, um, can you help us figure out what we see here around the proof of concept or around the drug development plans in general? I think we, you know, FDA, we see a lot of applications. I mentioned we're getting 1,500 new drugs. Uh, IND applications per year. And we, we learn a lot from these. And we would happily sort of share the insights that we're garnering from reviewing all those applications with you. Sometimes you have to ask us the right questions. And I, I used to work in the outside. And I understand that if you ask the wrong question, you're going to get the wrong answer. And that gets documented. And that's not great. So I understand there's a lot of you know, you know, uh, concern. But really think of these meetings as a, as a useful resource for you. Um, there are some specific recommendations, and I, and I think Rachel in the next talk will talk about these, where we actually recommend you to, to reach out. Um, so for example, if, if your product's never been approved or licensed in the United States, it's probably a good idea to come to talk to us, because that means there's really no established thinking on the product 
available for you. So there's no precedent for you to sort of um, to, to leap from. It's a new molecular entity, same situation. Uh, you're planning 505B2 application. So 505B2, so B1 is the typical marketing application pathway. B2 is sort of a, a follow-on pathway where you're relying on the, the previous findings of safety and effectiveness. Um, it's just more complicated legally, regulatorily. There's patent things involved, and so it's good to come in and talk to us about you know, your RLD or the reference list of drug that you're relying on, et cetera. Um, or if this is a critical product for, for the public health, you know, Ebola epidemics, think counterterrorism. You know, we want to help you make the most efficient and effective drug development plan possible to bring that product to the market quickly. Um, so we do want to engage with you. Um, and of course, any new uh, drugs that are trying to uh, establish a new indication, we want to try and also talk to you as well. So in addition to these recommendations, as, as I think Rachel will outline in the next few minutes, you can request a, a meeting with us for, for any, any other reason. The only requirement really is that you are developing that drug um, uh, in the United States. It, it can't just be you have an idea about a disease, but you don't necessarily have a drug or a product in mind yet. You should have a product. Um, so I apologize. I think I took up the entire balance of the time. There's no time for questions. Jeff is going to. Actually, Rachel is being kind enough to give you five minutes of her presentation time to open it for Q&A. Um, so for those of you in the room, the first two people who are uh, bold enough to make it up to the microphone will have time for questions for. Uh, it's a struggle. But, Kevin, you're, you're here the rest of the day, right? Yes. Okay. So and by the way, for some of those of you who are leaving, I must have done a good job. You're not, you don't have a drug, so. <laughs> <laughs> you got the thumbs up in the back of the room. All right. Excellent. Please, right up close to the microphone and uh, uh, stick it to... Or, uh, there we go. Keep it one very focused question so we can get to some of the others. We'll take an online question in addition to the two in the room. Thank yeah. you. I had two questions, but I'll take only one. Um, could you give us an example of maybe a, a study that wouldn't require an IND? I know you listed the requirements, but an example? Sure. So uh, rem remember that a clinical investigation, you're conducting the study in humans. So let's pretend we have a clinical investigation. But let's say you have a product that's already approved and the use that you're, you're studying is also already approved. And maybe all you're trying to identify, perhaps, is um, whether maybe uh, it's more tolerable or to understand maybe quality of life metrics that might not significantly alter the labeling. And if you find that your study does result in something that could alter your labeling, then what would be the procedure? So it's also important to keep in mind intent, too. So if you start out from the beginning thinking, yes, this will probably result in advertising changes for the product or new labeling changes, then you should very immediately come and talk to the FDA because, and not so much that we're upset that you didn't talk to us, but that if you come in with that study and it wasn't maybe conducted up to the certain requirements that are, are, are standards that are in place, we wouldn't be able to use that to support the changes in labeling, and then you might have to reconduct the study. Okay. Next question. Please step up nice close to the microphone for me. Good morning. Um, my question is concerning when is it appropriate to um, submit an individual IND versus um, the, the blending or bundling? bundling? Um, I work in the vaccine space. Um, so for every strain, say for a seasonal flu vaccine, uh, could be regulated as an individual biological entity. Um, at what point or how do I determine when it's necessary to bundle or to submit an individual INDs for each individual strain? Right. I, I probably am not the best to answer that question because I'm from CEDAR, the Center for Drugs. Um, but I would highly encourage you to reach out to the, the therapeutic, uh, I think it's OTR, yeah, OTOR, and talk to them. Okay. I mean, you can always propose to bundle the strains together mm -hmm. um, and then see what they say. If it's reviewed within the same review divisions, that they might be inclined to accept it. But remember, that's a matter of policy and not necessarily the, the regulatory or legal requirements. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's take one online question, if we could, please. If a product-specific product requires an IND be used with patients, not in healthy subjects, to establish bioequivalence, can the study be done outside the US without an IND and using healthy subjects? In other words, can the FDA mandate use of an IND for non-US non studies that will be submitted in the US? So I think. I think the simple answer is no. So if the study is being conducted outside of the US, we can't mandate an IND. Uh, 
However, if you're planning to rely on that data, you may want to come and talk to the FDA to make sure that you're complying with the, the appropriate requirements. For example, you know, we may still want to make sure that an independent ethics committee, like an IRB, was reviewing that study. Um, but there's a lot of nuances in that question, too, about certain bioavailability studies or bioequivalent studies that may be exempt from the IND requirements. But again, if you're going to use or rely on foreign clinical data uh, to support a U.S. marketing application, it's always a good idea to come and talk to the FDA, regardless of whether or not you may have to actually have an IND on file. Okay, and that's all the time we have for questions. Please help me thank Kevin for coming. Thank you.